Dr. DeMichael. I am originally from the East Coast and have come here from Nampa, Idaho. So we are absolutely in love with Idaho and I have been a doctor now for over 20 years. Irregular periods um, and the normality of it. That's actually a very good question. So I actually see a lot of patients who think, you know, a deviation of one or two days, something's wrong with themselves. Irregular periods are expected in the first couple years right after having your menstrual cycle. And of course, as we all know, when we get to that perimenopausal area, they do whatever they want to do. But if you have periods that are consistently irregular for a six month period, six month length of time, then we have a problem. And what I did is I, again, but you have an article here and I have per age group, yes, I'm sorry, that's it, per age group, what that range should be within. And if it's not in that range and it's not consistently in that range, like uh, my day is 38, then there's something going on. Now we look at, well, what could that be? It could be purely a hormonal issues that we have to address. It could be there's something in the uterus, such as uterine fibroids, polyps, an infection, and I will get a little into these topics a little further later on. Um, and there's treatments for all of this. And unfortunately, some people are a little hesitant to take hormones, but I'll be honest, half the hormones I prescribe are not for birth control. They're for getting these periods regular. You don't want to live with an imbalance because that affects your entire body and can have long-term consequences. Next, we're going to discuss mood swings. How, what is it severe? Is it a problem with hormones? So when we think of mood swings, we think of PMS, and then there is a less known title called PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And what they are, so symptoms, and I think most of us are familiar with them because it affects 90, 75, sorry, 75 percent of all the population of women, is that you have crying, irritability, more fatigue, more sleeping. Um, you're just not yourself, and, and this can start a week before your period and last even a little longer. It is caused by, and of course we are not 100% sure, but we believe it's caused by the drop in the hormones in our body. And then we're withdrawing from those hormones, and as we're doing that, it's, it's triggering these symptoms. Now PMDD is a much rarer form of this. This is only in about max 8% of women that have this. And this is when a point gets to a point where, yes, a lot of us have PMS, but we keep on going. We know this is what it is. It doesn't affect our life. PMDD is affecting your life. You cannot go on because these symptoms have taken over and literally wipes out a week of your life because you're just not yourself and the, and the symptoms are so severe that you can't do your normal activities. PMS, there's some you know, natural treatments like in your, your calcium, your B6, there are some herbal treatments over the counter, and of course we can treat them hormonally as well. Um, so if this becomes an issue in your life, please come to one of the three of us and we would like to talk to you about that and see if we can help you. The belief is, and this is because um, you can't get inside someone's brain, so we're going to come up with our theories and the theory makes sense, so let me explain it to you is that when the estrogen level and progesterone level drop, what it does is it goes to our brain. And because these are all hormones, and it goes to our brain and it drops off a level of something called serotonin. Now, serotonin may be familiar, like I've heard that word before. What it is, it's the hormone in antidepressants. Because if you think about it, the symptoms you're experiencing are similar to depression symptoms. And so by dropping off those hormones, you are dropping off the amount of serotonin. So we have treatments beyond birth control pills, which just knocks out your period, knocks out a drop off of hormones, to putting you on antidepressant. Seraphim was probably the most popular for quite a while. Seraphim is really just Prozac renamed. So um, I always like to go with the generic form. We have Zoloft, we have Paxil, we have Celexa, all of which are serotonin boosters, so they can help during that time period if that's something you choose. I discussed a little bit about estrogen levels being too low um, and part of the menorrhagia cycle. But I want, but let's point out the obviously two most common times when your estrogen level drops. Perimenopause. So perimenopause is when ovaries work one day, don't work the other, work a little bit. It's our way of our body slowing down to enter menopause. So 
that's when you get these crazy cycles. That's when you get periods coming or disappearing for months and then coming every two weeks. So that's because the ovaries are doing what they want. They're not quite shut down, but they're getting there. And that is signs of low estrogen, which will become the symptoms of hot flashes, mood changes, irritability, night sweats, and that goes on to day sweats. There's no time. There's no guarantee that it's going to be one time or another. Um, and sometimes even a fatigue and a little bit of like uh, fogginess, brain fogginess. Uh, and that's in the perimenopausal region. So then in younger girls, we have to worry about uh, low estrogen as well because the whole access from the brain down to the uterus hasn't been fully established. And so that may take years. So they may have irregular cycles. They may have no cycles at all. What I, in that age group and in other age groups, a concern for me is a person who is I feel like a very strong exerciser, a runner, or someone who has a very low body mass index. Because again, estrogen stored in our fat cells. If you don't have enough of those, you're not getting a period. But what that means to me also is that you're not providing enough estrogen to make your bones strong. So I don't want you at 20 going month, years without period and finding at 45 you already have osteopenia because your body has not had that time to build up your bone strength because you haven't had the hormones. This is a big topic but one that most people don't want to talk about. So it is actually part of my standard question with anybody postmenopausal because that tends to be the biggest group. With perimenopause, we're having that drop of estrogen, and that and that estrogen not only affects our symptoms, it also affects a good part of our body. Um, it is associated with issues in the vaginal region. So think of it, the whole vaginal region is affected by estrogen. So you're having your vagina, your vulva, your external vaginal tissue, even the, the urethra are starting to lose estrogen. They're getting, and let's just be honest, they're getting smaller. The tissue is getting thinner, it's losing its normal vaginal discharge, and that leads to terribly painful sex. But the good thing about this is this is usually treated with a non-oral, which means all those risk factors that we've all been scared to death about um, don't exist, but a topical treatment. Like I like to describe it as um, you have eczema, you're putting cream on your skin. You're going to put estrogen back to those areas because literally the vagina will shrink and that shrinking will actually cause the urethra to open and they increase your risk of urinary tract infections. Other issues that can cause painful sex are vaginal infections, STDs, UTIs, even an IUD, if it's not quite what your body likes. Even if it's in the perfect condition, some people will have sex with a pain with an IUD. So if you're experiencing painful sex, it's not you. So, and that's the problem, is most people think this is my fault, this is something I have to deal with. No, this is something that, please come to us and we'll help you with it. I talked a little bit about this back when we were discussing menorrhagia because it can cause a discharge, it can cause pain with urination, it can cause pain with intercourse, it can cause irregular bleeding. And a lot of times, unfortunately, there may be no symptoms at all. So my you know, recommendation is you're changing partners. If there's any question about your last partner or you just want to make sure you're okay, just get checked. And we do this routinely on girls the young ages just because we don't want you to have an S S sexually transmitted infection and not know about it. And so um, any anything that seems out of ordinary for you, you have someone that's not you know, a, a regular partner or a new partner, come on in. It's an easy check. Let's just make sure you're okay. Now again, the American College of UN, which is what we re receive all of our guidelines by, has in the last several years promoted two main birth controls in teenagers because our bodies are main, are in that age group more likely to get pregnant. And so we want to decrease the form of uh, the chance of you getting pregnant. And so what I have, first of all, to show you, again, is that picture of that IUD, where the IUD is inserted. I have an article on this, and I want you to actually refer to the website if you're in a teenage years where it talks about IUD insertion in young kids. And it literally goes in the uterus, we measure it, we open it up, and we cut the strings. It stays in for five to 10 years based on the IUD that you choose. And I'll get into that in a second. But expect it to 
cause cramping. Expect a couple days of cramping. So I tell my patients, ibuprofen is your best friend for the next couple days. If it's beyond that, if it's severe and you're feeling ill, please come in because there are complications associated with an IUD. When it comes to other forms of birth control, I actually am going to have this in each of one of our patient rooms so you can actually look at it. And I know it's not too clear to see here, but what it talks about is the effectiveness of the forms of birth control and how many women get pregnant per year on it. So you can see, very effective, IUDs. So the IUDs are the Lysida, Kylianus, kind of, they're both similar. Um, the Mirena, which is the by far most popular one, and the Paragard. The difference between them is these two contain hormones. 19.5 milligrams of levonorgestrel, which is a type of progesterone, 52, and this one has copper. So it has no hormones, which means it's not gonna make your periods any better, and it may make them heavier or crampier. The next one that's very popular is the next bond. Um, especially in younger age groups because no invasion of the uterus is pleasant. So this one just literally goes in the inner part of your arm and it lasts for three years at a time and it eliminates or decreases the amount of your menstrual cycle. There are issues with this and that can cause irregular bleeding, but we have fixes for that too. Um, now when you get to the less, little less effective are we have the patch, the pill, the ring, and the, oh, the shot, the depo shot. Depo shot is actually coming a little less out of favor unless you are familiar with it because it does have that negative effect of causing weight gain associated with it. Not universal, but it is still present and it's not present with the other ones. Um, birth control pills, very popular still, as long as you take them as directed, they can be very effective. Patch is wonderful because it lasts a week at a time and the ring is actually inserted vaginally. Sounds terrifying, super easy to do, and it lasts three weeks at a time. And so they all give you the same efficacy there. I'm gonna say, stay away from this, this line right here. Don't, just don't do it. You can't even get a diaphragm nowadays at pharmacy. They just don't even carry them anymore. Um, the fertility method, well, if this is part of who you are and how you feel, go for it. You, you know your body, just realize that the sperm can last three plus days, the egg can last of anywhere between 12 and 18 hours, so try to stay away from those most fertile times and you may have great success with it. The last one is the condom, and this is one I want to give a little advice to on some of the uh, younger generation who doesn't know this. The most common reason for condom failure is not that it broke, it's that you put it on, went, oops, wrong way, flipped it over, and then just literally put the most concentrated tip concentrated amount of semen at the tip of the condom and now just inoculate yourself with the most concentrated amount of semen. So that is a very common reason. So if you put it on wrong, throw that thing away and get another one.